Greetings, truth seekers and mystery lovers. Paranormal M invites you to subscribe and turn on notifications and drop a comment for a front row seat to our latest mind-bending tales. Get ready to explore the extraordinary. We promise it's a journey worth taking. A spirit, my imagination, or night terrors. For about three years straight, late into my teenage years, I started seeing a small girl dressed in what I could see as a white dress with black straight hair standing at the corner of my room looking at me at night. The entrance to my room had a small sort of alcove, so you have to take two steps or so to get into the main portion of the room. There was a corner here, so where my bed was positioned, you'd not be able to see my door, but that corner was visible. There was just enough light coming in from my window to light this corner up ever so slightly, so I could just about see the pattern of the wallpaper. But at this corner for years, a small girl stood peering around the corner, almost like a shy child might. This would happen consistently on nights I had some trouble sleeping, and it was almost like I could feel I wasn't on my own. When I opened my eyes and looked over there, she'd be there. I could blink or rub my eyes and stare for seconds at a time, sometimes up to a minute, and she would be there. This convinced me that it wasn't just my mind playing tricks on me. I could sit up and continue to stare, she wouldn't move. She'd just stare. When I turned the lamp on next to my bed, she'd disappear. Night terrors are not just things children suffer with, and it can be pretty awful to deal with them. Once I moved out of that house, this stopped happening, and I always looked for her around my room at night, in case she had followed me. Which is another reason that makes me think it wasn't just my head or a night terror. My question to you is twofold. Has anybody ever had this happen before? And could this just have been night terrors? It always freaked me out, but I never felt in any danger of anything because she never moved. I asked a couple of times during the night for her to come closer or say something or leave but there she would stand until I turn on the light. I've had many paranormal experiences throughout my life. These are just a few of them. In my childhood home, I remember having an imaginary friend. Stuff would move in the house, childlike footsteps that we would hear, and only stopped after we moved. I also apparently stopped talking about my imaginary friend as well. I don't remember much about the time. It was more of the experiences that took place after. In high school, I was in a bad car accident. I went down a ditch going too fast and hit multiple trees on the way down. The car was totaled. It was crushed in everywhere, ex except where I was sitting, though. I distinctly remember feeling like someone wrapped themselves around me and hearing my grandmother's voice telling me that it was going to be okay. She had died a few months earlier. My dad picked me up as I wasn't too far from home. We were calling our insurance and got a tow truck. When we got back to the scene, police were searching around the car. They had assumed I'd been thrown from it, and that there was no way I could have survived based on the state of the car. In college, I was staying with my aunt. I woke up to the sound of giggling. A small child was standing next to my bed, staring at me. I can still picture him clearly. That one scared me, and had my heart pumping for a while. Also in college, I felt someone breathing on me in my dorm. I didn't have a fan at the time, and there was no air conditioning. 
Myself and others in the dorm all had experiences, but nothing ever felt threatening. I've dreamt of my uncle a few times. The first was the most significant. He had a message for my mom. When I shared said message with her, it was a private message. Apologies for not sharing here. She started bawling, as if she had been praying and talking to him the night before, and I had answered the questions that she asked him. Till now, I live in a home that's over a century old. We've had many occurrences. Woken up to a woman's blood-curdling scream. Pots and pans left on the stove found on the floor of the other side of the island in the middle of the kitchen. Footsteps. The kids mentioned seeing a monster in their closets. Though I haven't heard that one in a while. And more recently, lights flickering. Daughter's toys started to sing randomly after she'd put to bed. And one night, I slept on the couch due to illness, and I heard someone telling the dogs to settle down. That's what we normally tell them to do. I assumed it was my partner, and the kitchen light, which is automatic, turned on as though someone had walked in. There was no one there. Kept turning on and off throughout the night, and the dogs wouldn't look away from the kitchen and would growl randomly with their haunches up. Things have settled down again. They amp up. Then they settle down, etc. So I'm enjoying the reprieve. There were footsteps, but no one there to make them. This happened to me back in the summer of 05. Let me set the stage. Oakwood Cemetery, Syracuse, New York. Main entrance. Hot August day. Somewhere around 11 or 12. Sun streaming down, bright blue sky, not a cloud to be seen or a breath of wind. All was utterly still, warm and quiet. I was the only person there. Oakwood is a beautiful, old, rural cemetery within the confines of SU's campus. It's been around since, like, 1859. So as you might imagine, there are some impressive monuments and statuary on the cemetery's grounds. I was in town to visit a friend and had some time to kill. So figured I'd take a walk into the cemetery and have a look around. As previously noted... I was standing at the main entrance, which is just off the main road. There were no cars on the road at the time. This, compounded by the stillness of the day, made it ridiculously quiet. It's important to stress how quiet it was because, well, the driveway into the cemetery is made of gravel. On top of the gravel was a small scattering of dead leaves, twigs, and small branches. So with every step I took, there was an audible corresponding crunch. Imagine my surprise when I heard similar crunching footsteps on the gravel just behind me as I walked. I stopped, turned around. No one was there. No animals either. Not even a squirrel. Shook my head, turned forward again, and continued walking. And again behind me. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I stopped again, turned around. Absolutely nothing there. And this time I spoke up. I'm only here for a visit. I mean no disrespect and I won't stay long. Please, let me proceed. And this time when I continued walking, there were no more accompanying footsteps. It wasn't scary, but it was definitely odd not to mention unexpected. I have no explanation, and again, no one else was there, and there was nowhere that anybody could hide, especially given the bright sunshine. Anyway, that's my little experience. (laughs) 
I think I experienced a paranormal activity on the 24th of December. Firstly, I recently finished my last semester of my grad school endeavor. So I've been enjoying much of my break by staying up ridiculously late, like up to 4 or 5 a.m. On the 24th, I decided to go to bed at approximately 4 a.m. A few minutes went by and I heard my door open, which I assumed was one of my parents, since they wake up at around that time to go to work. However, they usually check my room to see if we're, you know, okay. I supposed wrong. I didn't hear any footsteps, and all of a sudden I heard a tss, 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 as if someone was calling a dog to come over. Moreover, this was right beside me. I opened my eyes, and I was face to face in the opposite direction. My bed is in the corner, so whatever was making that sound was to my right, and my face was facing the wall, otherwise known as the left side. I have a small nightlight that shines light toward the wall I was facing, and I kid you not, I could see a female shadow with their hair floating. I couldn't turn my head because I was in a state of shock, nor as if I was in sleep paralysis. The noise ceased, and I let a few minutes go by to lessen the shock state I was in. Afterwards, I got up, turned on the light, went back to sleep. I woke up at around 11-ish and went to the kitchen, where I found my mom cooking the, well, cooking dinner. I told her what happened. She just kind of stared at me. She kept on cooking and said, Your father has repeatedly told me he can hear someone at night, and they make a noise as if they were calling out for a dog. It seems I have two crazy people in my home. We both looked at each other, and I let out a small laugh and joked about the topic and headed back to my room. Well, I thought that was where the abnormal activity ended, but it didn't. A few hours went by, and I came out of my room. It's right next to the living room, and I saw a type of mist or smoke in there. I assumed it was my mom's cooking. But that hypothesis went out the window and I felt a mist and a smoke cloud go into my mouth. I raised my voice and asked my mom if she was cooking tamales or burning chili. She said, no, I already finished cooking. I started rubbing my eyes because I could see this mist and smoke in the living room. My brother, who was in the living room, noticed my state of despair and asked me what was wrong with me. I responded, don't y'all see this mist and smoke? But my mom and brother responded, No, what mist or smoke are you talking about? I went back to my room and locked myself in there until we had a, well, until we had dinner. I haven't experienced anything as late, but I do feel uneasy staying up, so I'm now taking melatonin to knock out earlier. I'm not a big ghost believer but I like to entertain the idea because our world needs some excitement. <laughs> Thoughts? Accidental Haunting So I used to be really into the paranormal and ghost hunting and all that. I worked in a haunted ice arena and I used to host scary movie parties and such. Some of the regulars decided to go ghost hunting one night and are begging me to go with them. I kept telling them how dangerous it can be, having things attached to you, how you shouldn't just go in and be disrespectful. But they persisted. So finally I gave in and told them a perfect spot to take them. I wanted to take them somewhere that wasn't necessarily haunted, but that they could still get spooked and have their fun. I confess that I don't believe much in the whole crybaby bridge stuff. Here in Oklahoma, we have 27 of them. So I tell them of this old creepy one-lane bridge that's quote-unquote haunted, and we drive out there. 
We get a camcorder and a voice recorder and a temperature gauge and all the like. We get there and you could hear me just not really taking it seriously at all, but playing along so that way, you know, they could have their own fun. Suddenly one of them yells out that they found a pile of bones under the bridge. I told them to leave it and to not touch them, and I made my way down. Sure enough, there were bones. Lots of bones. Most of them looked like cattle bones in nature. But we did find a skull that resembled a very large dog with weird-looking canines. We also had found a cat that had been skinned with its fur piled down like you had taken a sock off. Now the creepiest part of ghost hunting to me has always been the creeps that hang out in those places. The types that hail Satan and spray paint pentagrams everywhere. Well, that's exactly what we found under this bridge. It was unnerving to say the least, so I suggested that we leave. At about that time, one of my friends started saying, Uh, there's something coming up the riverbank. Sure enough, moving towards us was darkness. Like, you know, when it's dark, but if you stare long enough at one spot, it gets darker. That. Like you could see the oak vines disappear behind this thing as it was moving closer. So we got to Getton. We made it back home at base and the haunted ice arena and started going over our evidence. Now here's where I started to shit my pants. As I'm listening to the recording, you can hear me clearly not caring and joking and mocking at the crybaby bridges with my friend. We were at the back of the pack. Just she and I are about to cross over the halfway point of the bridge when the recorder picked up static and white noise. It wasn't wind, because you could clearly hear the difference of wind hitting the recorder, and this was different. Shortly after that burst of static, in a low, hushed whisper, we caught a male saying, Leave me alone, I'm dying here. Freaky, right? It gets better. The camcorder that we recorded everything on was suddenly wiped clean. Video of before that we got there and after were untouched. It was just the filming under the bridge that was gone. Now I'll concede that it could have been used her error, but it gets even better. My friend that encountered the darkness on the creek bank was studying engineering or architecture. Can't remember which one. But he had asked his professor if he knew of this bridge. His professor told him that it's called the Coeta Salt Crossing Bridge, and it was built around 1912. But the most interesting thing he told him about the bridge is that before they built the dam out there, Bonnie and Clyde types would way, well, waylay people there, murder them, dump them in their cars into the river. Creepy. Not done yet. Gets better still. I had asked a deputy sheriff buddy of mine from that county if he knew about that bridge. The next time he came to play hockey, you know? And he told me, Yeah, when I was in high school they found one of our classmates shot in the stomach under that bridge. They thought it was a murderer at first, but all this fishing gear was still there and nothing was taken. Fishing. They finally realized it was suicide when they thought the pistol that he shot himself with was there. He shot himself in the gut and threw it in the creek, and he didn't even leave a note. I got pale white because I immediately remembered the message we got on our recorder. Leave me alone, I'm dying here. So we may not have found a grieving mother or her crying baby, but we accidentally stumbled on something a bit darker, and I was humbled. What visited me in the night? I was young. I grew up on the outskirts of a small town in the Midwest. It was close to the Great Lakes. The town had a population of about 8,000 at the time and was established in 1833. We lived well outside of town in an area that was mostly well, either forest or farmland. 
There was a small trailer park fairly close on the other side of the railroad tracks, built on a raised mound, so high that you couldn't even see the trailer park from the second floor of her house. But to give you an idea how remote we were, the half a mile stretch in the other direction only had three other houses and only on one side of the road. After that, there was a two and a half stretch of pretty much nothing but trees or crops before you reached the town proper. At the time, I would have called the farmhouse we lived in a mansion, but I was very small. We lived there for about five years, moving in about the time I just entered kindergarten. In retrospect, and looking at it on Google Street View now, it was a fairly small farmhouse, probably built in the early 1900s. The Property While this isn't directly related to the events I'll discuss later, it occurs to me it might be relevant. So I'm going to, well, I'm just going to include it now. We owned six acres of land, and even then I knew I was fortunate to have so much room to explore and play in. The property was much longer than it was wide. The house sat fairly close to the road, and the mass of land had been cleared that I now assumed to be used as farmland for crops. There was a ring of trees around the perimeter, and a well-worn walking path adjacent to the ring of trees. Outside of a very small grove of apple trees directly next to the house towards the front of the property, the rest of the land was an empty field full of tall weeds. While I spent most of my time playing and exploring the closest half of the property, I would never go back in the acres alone. The stretch of trees to the north didn't bother me, nor did the patch of trees in thick forest to the northwest. The patch to the southwest, however, terrified me. I would never go anywhere near it alone, or even if I ventured that far with friends or adults made me extremely uncomfortable being near that forested corner. I occasionally still have nightmares about that patch. The Wood Pile Closer to the house, right at the start of the path to the back acres, was a massive wood pile that I spent a good deal of my time playing in. It was easily five feet if not six feet high, as tall if not taller than an adult. And I'm pretty sure larger than our house. It was composed of irregular shaped planks that were made by cutting the slightly rounded edges off trees. I'm not a woodcutter, nor do I know the process, but it always hit me as odd that so much timber was left behind. While the planks were too rounded and irregular to be in shape for use in construction, it seemed like a lot of timber that could have been ground up to make particle board. I assume the wood pile was like a byproduct of clearing the land for farmland. Again, not a woodcutter, but I will mention that there were no tree trunks to be seen, nor were any stumps left in the woodpile. They obviously must have been piled up in the clearing process, but no idea what happened to them, or why they were hauled off while the irregular planks were left to rot. I can only assume this mini logging operation had happened a number of years before, probably decades. The planks were extremely old and weathered from the elements, and very, very brittle. Even though many had sections as thick as 2 by 4 they were prone to break under the weight of my small frame, and if I had put my mind to it, I was capable of breaking them in half with my 5-10 to 10 year old strength. I only bring all this up to establish that the land was not being used for what it was intended to be. In fact, pulling it up on Google Maps to this day, those six acres are still not used for farming, even though nearly all of the surrounding plots now are. The house. The house was completely square. On the bottom floor, half was divided between a dining room and a front room the other half split between a master bedroom with the remaining space divided between the kitchen and two flights of stairs. One leading down to an entryway, which included another flight of stairs down to the basement, and the other leading upstairs. 
I don't think it was remodeled. I think the upstairs were designed to basically be a livable attic. You went up half a flight of stairs to a small landing, then had to turn 180 degrees to another half flight of stairs that led up to a long alcove. From the alcove, you had two doors on either side, one to a small bedroom and one to a slightly larger L-shaped bedroom. Both bedrooms were equipped with two insanely large walk-in closets and storage areas. They sloped due to the roof, but they were large enough that my older brother used one as his bedroom, as though he had enough space for couches in the bedroom proper to hanging out with his friends in. The slightly larger bedroom that eventually became mine was large enough to fit two double beds in comfortably, plus a large chest of doors and plenty of floor space to play in. Closets are scary when you're a kid, large ones even more so. Mine were large enough to fit every conceivable monster my mind could imagine. More than enough room for Dracula, a wolfman, the boogeyman, and plenty of room for a Bigfoot or two. My parents weren't much for molly coddling, and I was expected to go to bed for myself every night. There's a small window on the stairway landing that allowed some light from the yard security light, but when you made that 180 turn, you were standing at a flight of stairs leading up to pitch darkness where the next light switch could be found. Not too proud to admit that most nights, I made that ascent crying in fear. The Household I have a large family, but my siblings were all much older and every year saw another one striking out on their own, and a number of us just dwelling there getting consistently smaller. One might come to visit or stay briefly when times are tough, but we went from six when we first moved in to eventually two to four. My father traveled for work, and my older teenage brother spent most of his time out running around. So by the time I was nine, most nights it was just me and my mom. Putting this as politely as I can, my closest brother is much older than me, a high school jock and kind of a dick. Even for brothers, I can't say a relationship was good at that point. Most of our interactions went between him ignoring me to tormenting me for his own amusement. I tended to avoid him as much as possible because our time spent together was never enjoyable usually ended with me crying or our mom screaming, Leave your brother alone. The Encounter Honestly, almost no idea when this happened. Couldn't tell you what season, and only slightly comfortable in guessing it was probably about the time I was eight. Maybe barely after I turned nine. The only thing I can say for certain is, my father was away in business at the time, and while I'd share my bedroom with my older sister for the first few years, she moved out, and I had the bedroom to myself. Old houses creak. They creak and moan as they settle. Most nights I'd lie in bed terrified, listening to these sounds trying to convince myself it wasn't a monster coming to get me. Eventually a train would pass by, and the motion of it shaking the house would always put me to sleep. <laughs> Weird, right? So I assume it was a night like any other. If I'd seen a scary movie or read a horror story, I'd walk up the stairs in fear and lay in bed listening to every small noise wondering what it was, until a train rocked me to sleep. Barring a nightmare, I almost never woke up in the middle of the night. I would usually be sleeping until the sun came up, or if my mom would wake me up, whichever would come first. I didn't have an alarm clock, and I have no memory of there ever being a clock in my room. Total stab in the dark. But sometime after midnight, I was awoken to a sound outside my bedroom door, a little alcove. I'd have to say I was a fairly sound sleeper back then, because I don't ever remember being woken up by my brother coming home or any other sound for that matter. But this time, I was woken up by a very slow, very long creak of floorboards. The first immediate thought was it was the house settling, and I turned over to go back to sleep. 
but it didn't stop. The sound of footsteps in each creak just took forever. I wasn't even scared at first, just curious trying to figure it out. Way more noise than the house would make, but if it was someone out there, they were just moving very insanely slow. No sounds of footfall if it was someone. They'd just about have to be barefoot or in socks. Just the slow sound of one floorboard groaning in protest of the pressure followed painfully slowly by another floorboard groaning in relief as the pressure was removed. I sat up in bed just listening and arguing with myself. Something has to be there. There's no way anyone is there. It's just the house making noises. It was so slow, it wasn't even scaring me. It was just me listening intently to it. And it went on forever. Easily 20 minutes or more. Long enough that I eventually was convinced it sounded like nothing more than maybe my brother creeping home late and trying not to wake anyone up. Or even someone breaking in and trying to steal things in the dark without making a sound. It seemed very much like the sound of something pacing very slowly back and forth, directly in front of my door. The noise would slowly, ever so slowly, move left for a while, then so slowly move back in the opposite direction, like it had no destination in mind. Eventually I was convinced, okay, this is absolutely not my imagination. Someone has to be there. I suspected my brother was trying to scare me. I went to call his name and found my voice frozen in my throat. My mother was sleeping directly below me, and I could absolutely hear if I would scream, and if it was my brother pranking me, yelling would be put to an end. But I never felt such terror in my life at just the thought of yelling. At that age, yelling chases everything bad away and brings your mother to your rescue. But all I felt was pure dread at the thought of releasing a scream. Then I heard the sound of the doorknob moving and had any doubt that I wasn't alone being completely erased. I dove under the covers and balled myself up. Just like the creaking, the sound of the door was painfully slow. Like a three-year-old trying to open a door unable to get a good grip. I could hear it slowly turning and then stopping. An attempt at turning then release. Just for freaking ever. I had a mental image of my brother in a sheet trying to scare me, but even at the time it just seemed so weird. Why is he doing it this way? I could see him spending a few minutes wandering in the alcove, moaning like a ghost at the top of his lungs, until he was sure I was awake, then jumping on the bed and making me cry and laugh at me. But this style of dramatic seemed unnecessary and unlike him. After easily a dozen clumsy attempts, the doorknob was finally turned enough to open the door. Barely. You could hear the door barely moving away from the frame. Not nearly far enough for anything to fit, though. Now came the sound of something pushing on the door without enough force to open it. The door would creak slightly, open a bit, and then fall backwards to a near-closed position over and over. Like everything up to this took for frickin' ever me shaking under my blanket the whole time. <sighs> Even allowing for a child's perception of time, I can say with confidence that we were easily at the 30 minute mark at this point. Probably much, much longer. Minimum of 30 minutes from the first time I heard the creaking of the floorboards outside of my room to the time the door was finally pushed with enough force to finally swing completely open. And that's when the groaning started. Let me stress that this wasn't the high-pitched stereotypical look at me pretending to be a ghost moaning. This was sporadic elderly person trying to get out of bed groaning. When the door opened, I was expecting or hoping for a grand finale of my brother running around making a ghost noise at the top of his lungs. But 
but what I got was a continuation of the slow creeping on floorboards toward my bed, now accompanied by a low groan. Like everything else so far, it was insanely stretched out and just painful waiting for what was going to happen next. By this point, I was completely balled into a fetal position, trying my best to not even cry or breathe, terrified to make even the slightest sound. Spoiler, this shit goes on for hours. I'm fully aware time moves slower for kids, but this would extend until just shy of dawn. Even if it started as late as three in the morning during the summer when nights are shortest, and I'm pretty sure it didn't happen in summer. I don't remember feeling overheated under the blankets. We're still looking at two or three hours minimum. So the entity circles the bed in what felt like forever. Somewhere about an hour in, it starts touching me. I can feel a barely there brush that would eventually, oh so slowly, become a very light poke. Somewhere before dawn, it just stopped. While I allow for my, eventually, falling asleep, I can't imagine sleep taking me when I was so frozen with fear and quivering violently. It just stopped. The touching and poking came at a nail's, snail's pace. And when I went five minutes without being touched, it felt like it was just looming over me. I never heard the sound of leaving. No slow departure, no creaking of floorboards, it just stopped. I waited until the room was completely illuminated, not even feeling safe to come out from under the covers when I could tell the sun was breaking. I scrambled down the stairs to tell my mom what happened, and I'm fairly certain it was a Sunday morning. Didn't have to go to school, and wasn't worried about watching cartoons. Started babbling to my mom about seeing a ghost. She was irritated and didn't get a lot of days of sleep in and wasn't willing to give up her extra sleep for my imagination. She wasn't interested in hearing about it, so I caught a few hours of sleep in her bed. For years, I'd tell my friends about the night I saw a ghost. But as I got older, I realized it probably was just my older brother playing a trick on me. The Reveal my brother is still a bit of an ass, but that's just his way. When I reached adulthood, and we'd get closer and form a much stronger bond. He's got his own way, but he tried to be a better big brother after I hit my teens than he ever did when I was a kid. But he still revels in the various pranks that he might pull on me. He very frequently feels the need to remind me that at one point he held all the cards. If I was playful or sometimes resentfully bringing up some of the shittier things he did, he'd gloat about it with a big grin as if remembering better days. So one holiday when I'd hit my thirties, I stayed late after a family dinner and it was just the two of us drinking coffee and talking. He has always brought up something he did to me when I was young tricking me into eating dog food when I was three, making me lick 9-volt batteries, tricking me into thinking, on accident, meant intentionally. So it was harder to snitch on him. Take your pick, it's a long list, and I realized that we'd never talk about it. So I threw out dressing up as a ghost to scare the shit out of me, and he countered with, what? I figured this had to be the biggest jewel in his prankster crown, without a doubt the most elaborate and time-intensive trick he'd ever pulled off on me. Figured he'd laugh heartily and brag about how he scared me, and how he got me. You know, and gave some details to Jock's memory. I, I never did that. Considering he remembers every crappy little thing he did to me when he was 8, 10, and 12, etc. Can't imagine something this big slipping his mind. Like I said, it never seemed his style. He was big, well, he wasn't big on subtlety. Way more of a quick scare, make you laugh and cry in your face type. Usually very low effort for his payouts. I don't think he forgot. I have no reason to believe he's lying. Not admitting it is not his style at all. So, what happened to me?
The Very Odd House. Background. Back in the 80s, my dad had a heart attack, which put us in a bit of a financial bind. Things were tight for a while. After an aggressive bill collector got my dad worked up again, he had another heart attack. And long story short, we ended up losing our house. Outside of a brief transitional period when we relocated to another state for the first time in my life, we were no longer homeowners, and money was extremely tight. I have absolutely no idea how my parents came in contact with the person who'd set us up with our next residence, quote-unquote. But eventually, they'd find us a new house, which could be rented on our budget. The House from the outside, it did look like a house, mostly. We were living in a small southern town, which at one point had been considered a very large southern town, but not for a good 50 years. The building in question had most likely been built sometime between 1910 and 30. There were a few theories to what this basically abandoned building used to be. One being that it might have been a small shipping company with bedrooms to accommodate drivers overnight. Honestly, I don't think it was big enough to handle much cargo, so I lean more toward the second theory. My father suspected at one point it had been a type of company-owned boarding house where two people could live together. Each would have a side where they would have their own individual offices and bedrooms, then share a kitchen and a living room area. It was also built into a lot right next to a large brick lumber yard. It's possible that at one time it was connected to that business. The house was a large square, divided into three equal sections. In the middle was a large living room area, a kitchen with a bathroom attached. On either side of that were three more rooms. One medium, one small, and one large. They were all proper bedrooms with a private bathroom. Each medium room at the front of the house had its own door for entry, but no closets. It wasn't practical as a bedroom at all. Which comes back to the theory that it was mostly designed to be a small office with its own entry point. All in all, the building had five doors to the outside, three in the front, and one on each side to the smaller rooms. I have no idea what it was used for, before how long it had sat empty. Easily at least ten years. Probably longer. It was in rough condition. The deal my parents had made with their new landlord was that we would handle the cleaning and the manual labor to fix the place up, and they would supply bare materials needed, but rent it to us at a reasonable price. It needed a lot of work. It was during summer break, and for weeks we would put in 12-hour days cleaning and fixing and painting and repairing the house before returning to the house that we were losing. Exhausted. It had been sitting so long, and everything had to be scrubbed before we could even put a coat of paint down. The dust and grime was so thick you couldn't just paint over it. All the rooms were covered with the ugliest, faded, most out-of-date wallpaper you can imagine. Probably from like the 50s or 60s. The three-dimensional type with the fuzzy textures. We put up wood paneling over it, and it was a dramatic improvement. After weeks of work, overlooking the really weird layout, we had a fairly homey-feeling residence all to ourselves. If you overlook the massive weirdness in my room. The screen windows. This was the first thing I noticed, and it creeped me out for a reason I couldn't really describe. All of my screen windows were covered with bobby pins. The screen windows were old, the likes I've never seen in my lifetime. Thick, solid wood frames covered with chipping black paint. The metal mesh wasn't anything like we're accustomed to in the modern age. At least twice as thick, probably more, and made from an alloy that wasn't weatherproof. They were all rusty. But on each window screen, there were at least 20 or 30 bobby pins inserted into them. 
If it had just been lower down, I wouldn't have thought a bored little girl maybe might have put them there. But they were all over the whole screen. Even an adult would have had needed a ladder to insert higher up ones. There was no discernible pattern, and I could recognize at least. All I knew is that it seemed to be very deliberate. It wasn't something done on a whim or out of boredom. My room was the only one that had bobby pins on the screen windows. In fact, everything I described was unique to my room. The bedroom on the opposite side had none of these anomalies. The windows. The windows were nailed shut, all of them. Five or six nails per window. I don't know why. It turns out, really, that the windows had been painted over enough times that even when I pulled the nails out, it was still too stuck, made me unable to open the windows. They were basically glued shut with paint. Whoever had stayed there at one point, though, really didn't want anyone coming through a window. This included the bathroom window. The bathroom window wasn't even half a window. It was so high you could barely see it of it. Since the building was built up on concrete blocks from the outside, the bathroom window was at least six feet off the ground. Even if you could fit through it, you'd need a fairly tall ladder to access it. Nonetheless, it was nailed shut. Again, only in my room, no other windows were nailed shut in the house. The bathroom. All original fixtures. The bathtub was exactly that. An old-school 1920s standalone porcelain bathtub, complete with the little feet. That's called a clawfoot tub. The most offsetting part about the bathroom, though, was the sliding lock. It wasn't inside the bathroom like you would expect. There was no lock inside the bathroom for privacy. But the biggest sliding lock in the whole house was on the outside of my bathroom as if someone was so afraid that something was going to come in for them that they needed an extra layer of protection on top of having the window nailed shut. And yeah, it did cross my mind that maybe it was being used to lock someone into the bathroom, but that didn't really make much sense. If they needed to, they could just break the window and escape that way. The other two bathrooms in the house had hook latches on the inside like you'd expect for privacy. The closets. Both bedrooms had two closets. One smaller closet that was just big enough for our hanging clothes and slightly larger storage closet. It's all about to get a whole lot weirder. Nothing was odd about the smaller closet. There was a lot going on with the other one, though. It was a decent-sized closet, large enough that you could walk into it. It was big enough to fit my dresser and a rack of bookshelves above it and on one side. The other side had a set of deep wood shelves that were large enough to hold a full old school stereo system, which is what I used them for. Outside of bobby pins, the next thing I noticed was the doorknob to the closet was different. It was different than any other one in the house. All the other doorknobs were rounded and made of tin or lead or bronze. I don't know, whatever old doorknobs are made of. This one was painted white with an oddly shape to it. I had suspicions, and after testing my theory, sure enough, it was of crystal or cut glass. I spent part of the day cleaning off all the paint and felt weirdly fancy for having a nice doorknob. Weird part was, it was the only one on one side. There was no knob on the inside. The door could not be opened from the inside, and, like the bathroom, there was a sliding lock on this closet's door. Inside the closet was the weirdest part. The picture. The picture was adhered, excuse me, the picture was adhered to a large, smooth, rounded-edged square of glass. I believe it was made to be a paperweight. The glass was at least an inch thick and had some weight to it. The picture was a black and white image of a couple from probably the 30s or 40s. It could have been a man with his wife, a father with his daughter, or even a grandfather and his middle-aged daughter, I don't know. 
because the part of the photo had their heads in it, it had been sort of sliced off. One long, straight, and even slightly diagonal cut was most likely a razor having sliced their heads clean off. While a very large part of me wanted to throw the picture away, something told me I shouldn't. It was very literally the only thing left in the house, and apparently a number of other people had made the same decision. Just leave the creepy photo where you found it, because someone put it there for a reason. I stashed it in the back of the closet where I found it, and tried not to think about it. The Encounter I'm going to skip all the could-have-been-my-imagination encounters. All the bumps in the night, all the feelings of someone else being in the room with me, the sudden cold spots like something walked through you, hell, even the sound of a closet door creaking open, even though that was witnessed by friends spending the night, or even the night I woke up to a very distinct sound of breaking glass, couldn't find anything broken in the room after. I can dismiss all of this as a teenager's overactive imagination. I'm just going to cover the one. There's no way that was my imagination sort of event. Prior to moving in, we had raised large dogs. Since we were moving into an unfenced, smaller property, we had to put our dogs up for adoption so they could have you know, more room that they needed to move around. They were given to friends and family. It was probably harder on us than the dogs. They had a nice yard and they were well taken care of. So, when we made the move, I adopted a kitten. My mom adopted one of those annoying, bug-eyed, yippy lap dogs. No idea which kind. She had a few over the years. At the risk of being a dick, I hated that dog. My own, well, my one housewarming gift was to get a small throw rug so I wasn't met with the cold hardwood floor on my feet first thing in the morning. Mom's dog had a tendency to sneak into my room in the middle of the night and use my rug as its personal bathroom. You wake up a few times where the first thing you feel is your foot going into a cold puddle of pee or straight into a pile of dog crap. You'd probably feel the same way I did about that dog. A month or two, and a number of strange encounters later, I get into bed one night. It had to be fall, probably late September or October. I get under the blankets and immediately feel my cat jump on my bed and curl up next to my feet. I hear the door creak open slightly and my eyes narrow. It was most likely my mom's dog coming into my room to go potty on my rug. I shift myself into hunting position. I have thick curtains and there's not a lot of light in the room at night. I'm going off sound and I wait until I'm sure I'm hearing the dog reaching my rug. I can still feel my cat against my feet. Once I hear the movement close enough, I lurch down and snatch the barely visible shadow figure on my rug with a I gotcha, you little shit. I'm met with a confused meow. And I realized I wasn't grabbing my dog's dog, or sorry, my mom's dog. I was scooping up my own cat. Then what's at the foot of my bed against my foot? I already have my cat in my arms. I fly out of my bed, clutching my cat, and scramble through my room in the dark and throw the light switch on. Nothing. Just me and my cat. Nothing on the bed at all. I go to sleep in the couch. There was no way I was going back into that room. There's absolutely no mistaking or imagining the weight of something jumping on the bed near your feet, let alone pressing it against you. Something had been in the bed with me, but my cat obviously came in after the fact. I'd heard the door open and tracked the sound of the movement in the dark, thinking it was my mom's dog. The only other animal in the house, too. But when the lights came up, there were only two of us even though I know I could feel something against my feet after I had my cat in my hands. Aftermath My friends were already well familiar with all the weirdness of my new place. A few had already spent the night and found it unsettling themselves. On a friend's recommendation, we go and talk to that one weird teacher I'm pretty sure every school has. 
the one that's into white magic and astrology or other assorted hippie type activities. Usually the art teacher, or it was in our case. From her advice, I started filling my room with various crystals, mostly amethyst, since it's supposed to have protective powers. A good part of the money from my part-time job would go into buying crystals for a while, geode crystals and whatever. I had dozens of them all over my room after that, most of them in or around the one closet with the lock on the outside and the creepy picture inside of it. After a while, the activity would almost completely stop, leaving just a general creepy vibe. I'd never talked directly to my mother about any of this, because I didn't want her to blame it on the music I was listening to or the games I was playing. Other Gen Xers will have a better idea of the general attitude towards certain bands or Dungeons and Dragons in the 80s. Mom apparently felt something was off in the house too, though. She was a Christian and always had a house blessed before he moved in. The local pastor would come in, say some prayers, sprinkle some holy water around. This time was no exception, outside of the fact that it didn't seem to help. Six or so months in, my mom did something unusual. She decided to have the house blessed again with a different church. I wasn't there for the first blessing, but I was for the second. I followed behind them, curious to see how they'd react when they hit my room. It was a different pastor and three or four members of the church. They would walk into each room and instead of holy water, the pastor was anointing the corner of each room with olive oil. Maybe it was because of all my heavy metal posters, but I found it amusing that the whole group of them became visibly uncomfortable as soon as they hit my room. The prayers got faster and shorter. He only anointed two of the four corners as they scampered out as quickly as they could. This always stuck with me. The olive oil he touched all the corners with in the other rooms either evaporated or were absorbed without a trace. Except one corner of my room. And only that one spot had left a fingerprint-shaped stain in the wood paneling that may still be there to this day. I can vouch that it lasted for at least seven years afterwards. No idea why, but it reacted differently in my room than it had in all the other rooms in the house. Pulled it up on Google Maps, and it looks like it was the southeast corner of the room, in case anybody has a theory about that. I'm sure I saw a ghost, and no one believes me. So I work in event management, and a few years ago I was hosting an event in the evening for approximately 50 guests. The event was being held at an 18th century farmhouse converted to an event barn space. It's about 15 or 20 minutes from the city, so we organized a bus to take everyone. I was the only one from the team representing that evening, so it was my job to meet everyone and make sure they all got home. The event was uneventful. It finished at around 11.30 p.m. It was winter, and it was pitch dark outside and freezing cold. I'm waiting outside the bus, counting heads. Then I needed the bathroom. I called my husband off the bus. He had come along for free food and asked him to take my place. I went inside. The place was empty as everyone was on the bus. I went to the toilet, washed my hands, then went to leave the bathroom. As you do so, you walk through a small rectangle-shaped room, or a corridor. Now, it's kind of a warm light, not pitch dark, but certainly not bright. As I walk through this room, a figure passed me. Now, I say figure, as I just couldn't tell you for the life of me what that face was like. They kind of brushed past and were quite dark. By dark, I mean I don't remember face or clothes, just that it was a person. Now the person took me by surprise as everybody should have been on the bus and the place was empty. So as they brushed past, I kind of said, whoops, sorry, and they just very quickly kept going. 
It was all in a split second. I just had a weird, uneasy feeling, but that was maybe down to the lack of communication of them being in there in the first place. To me, I thought it was a lady. As I got out of the bus, I told my husband that we have to wait. There's a lady inside of the toilet. We waited some time, but it was getting late, like 15 minutes or so. My husband went back in to check if she was okay. No sign of her. We went into the back where the man who owns the barn was. He helped search the entire barn and toilets and couldn't find anyone. We did a head count, and we had everybody on the bus, after all, really. I felt really, really weird about it for weeks, just a strange vibe I can't really explain. I'm convinced it was a ghost. I casually caught up with the man who owns the place a few months later, and he told me it used to be a stop-off for market traders, and there's certainly reports of haunting. Does that sound silly? Has anyone spoken with a ghost? Unwittingly, I did on Sunday. I live in Baltimore, Maryland, and my parents still live in the townhouse that we moved into in 85. Growing up, other farm members would have minor experiences that could be written off. Now I'm 44 and still visit daily. My sister has three kids that stay with them in that home two of which were younger than five years old. I'm completely convinced now that there's this little boy ghost that's living there as well. Sunday afternoon, I was at my father's and I needed to swipe some TP for my apartment. You dig? So I went up to grab some toilet paper out of the bathroom on the second floor. All the bedroom doors were closed. My mom was out to church, so it was dark and quiet. I knocked to see if anybody was in the bathroom, and I heard, Hello? I said, Oh, sorry, buddy. You using the bathroom? And he replied, Nope. So I opened the door, and the freaking bathroom was empty. I shouted to Monk, my sister's nickname, who was in a room and the doors closed. I asked her about where my nephew Kai was. He was in a room with the door closed. They were in there watching TV. She didn't even know I was upstairs until I knocked and shouted through her door. I swore Kai was in the bathroom and didn't even realize what happened until it was over. Thinking about it further, I realize now that the voice didn't sound like it was in the bathroom, but maybe closer. It was faint but distinct. That's why I asked if my nephew was in there using it. The thing that gets me is it happened in real time. I spoke and it freaking spoke back. You dig? A bit of background on this child ghost, if that's what it is. My older nephew had an imaginary friend that he proved to me was real. One day when he was young, about the same age as my nephew Kai is now. But that's another story if you want to hear it. The short of it, he described him to me as a little boy with black and white striped shirt. He also said... He looks just like me. Kind of creeped me out. My father was born with a veil over his face. He served in the Navy, a serious man. He's seen things, doesn't talk too much about them, but he has told me about things he sees in between sleep and waking up. Calls it twilight. One day he said he thought he saw my nephew was playing on his bed while he slept. He woke up and saw a little boy sitting at the end of the bed. He smiled, hopped off the bed, and left the room. My father shrugged it off, but when I asked him how he looked, he said he told me the little boy had a black and white striped shirt on. That's all he really remembered. This was years ago. My younger nephew still has an imaginary friend, but not sure he's so innocent anymore. My boyfriend sleep-talked for the first time. I will add that since the plot of the story has happened, nothing as strange has happened since. 
I, a 19-year-old female, have been with my boyfriend, 21 male, for over four years now. Throughout our relationship, he told me he keeps experiencing sleep paralysis and that it became more and more frequent. He had maybe one or two in the first three years, but last year they kept getting worse. We're both students, and for the past two years he's been living in a rented apartment with a good friend of his. Sometimes I'd spend the night there as well. One time in May, he told me he'd experienced sleep paralysis again, and that he was aware and awake but wasn't able to move or say anything like his lips were glued together. He said he tried to scream my name, to wake me up so I could help him, but nothing ever came out of his mouth. He also mentioned that he kept seeing one of the corners of the room as a big black shadow that made him feel nauseous. He eventually got out of it and went back to bed. Next day, I was still there. He asked me to stay with him in case something happened again starting to get a bit scared, I guess. I tried to stay awake in case something happens, but I think I immediately fell asleep. So this is how I woke up in the middle of the night. I heard some sounds. I immediately opened my eyes. Here was my boyfriend, laying on the side with his back to me, resting his head on my hand, saying some random shit in a language I've never, ever heard before looking at that exact same corner that he mentioned about when he had sleep paralysis. The weirdest thing is that it seemed like he was having an actual conversation. He would talk, and then would stop, like if somebody was answering. And then he would talk again, and so on. I was like, what the fuck is he doing? I called his name. He immediately stopped talking. And then the heaviest silence filled the room for what seemed like an eternity. Then, he started hysterically laughing for a few seconds, then passed out out of nowhere. I checked to see if he was okay and he started snoring. At least, I knew he fell back to sleep. I wasn't able to sleep that night. I turned around and cried until I saw the light outside. Next day I told him about it, and he apologized for scaring me. I said that it wasn't his fault, but it was clear that he felt bad. We asked his friend if he heard anything, and he said no, which made me feel like maybe I was just dreaming. But then he added that he woke up as well that night but wasn't able to move, felt like he couldn't breathe, and claiming that he saw the weirdest shadow in the corner of his room. The apartment is consecrated, but I always feel uneasy being there. Another thing I'll add, although I don't know if it's important or not, but my boyfriend's roommate has nightmares pretty often would wake up screaming every time.